Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to Voices. Uh, in today's episode, I thought it might be kind of fun to read a couple of pretty famous, pretty popular um, creepy pastas. I even did mood lighting. There's like no lighting on, <laughs> except light, obviously, on the wall because you gotta be able to see something. Um, so, what kind of prompted this is a couple of things. One, I'm not super versed in creepy pasta. I know what it is. I've read a couple of like the more like I guess famous ones that turned into other things but I'm not like an avid creepy pasta reader which I should probably change I've read a few just not like maybe as much as I should um and their um Fathom Events is, is doing a um a one night only where you can see this movie called The Stairs um and I got tickets to see it it's not until August the 12th I believe um, but it is based off of a creepypasta and over the years of just exposure to different horror things, you know, video games, movies, short stories, um, just a lot of conversations around things that have stemmed from creepypastas. I was like, I'll do a video on some of those. So it is going to be me reading, which is either going to, you're just going to be super pumped about or you're going to be like, ugh, but hopefully the former. Um, so I'm going to read three creepy pastas. Um, two are ones that I found on a list of like really popular ones that have based on numbers of shares, I believe. Um, and then the third one I'm going to read is this, the one that the movie, the stairs is based off of, at least I hope. So there's quite a few, um, different ones about stairs. I, I'm hoping this is the right one. I'll know maybe after I see the movie, which I'll do a review on anyway. So the first one I'm going to read is called The Russian Sleep Experiment. This is one of the ones that was like, it's like the number one most shared creepypasta story that ever was um, so far. So um, it's not super lengthy. I think these are technically maybe like a little bit longer than the ones I read from Nightmare Soup. Um, that's okay. It's going to be fine. All right. Um, let me see. Okay. Russian researchers in the late 1940s kept five people awake for 15 days using an experimental gas-based stimulant. They were kept in sealed environment to carefully monitor their oxygen intake so the gas didn't kill them, since it was toxic in high concentrations. This was before closed-circuit cameras, so they had only microphones and five-inch thick glass porthole-sized windows into the chamber to monitor them. The chamber was stocked with books, cots to sleep on but no bedding, running water and toilet, and enough dried food to last all five over a month. The tough subjects were political prisoners deemed enemies of the state during World War II. Everything was fine for the first five days. The subjects hardly complained, having been promised falsely that they would be freed if they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 30 days. Their conversations and activities were monitored, and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasingly traumatic incidents in their past. And the general tone of their conversations took on a darker aspect after the, the four-day mark. After five days, they started to complain about the circumstances and events that led them to where they were and started to demonstrate severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other and began alternately whispering to the microphones and one-way mirrored portholes. Oddly, they all seemed to think they could win the trust of the experimenters by turning over their comrades, the other subjects, in captivity with them. At first, the researchers suspected this was an effect of the gas itself. After nine days, the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of the chamber, repeatedly yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. He continued attempting to scream, but was only able to produce occasional squeaks. The researchers postulated that he had physically torn his vocal cords. The most surprising thing about this behavior is how the other captives reacted to it, or rather didn't react to it. They continued whispering to the microphones until the second of the captives started to scream. The, set, the two non-screaming captives took the books apart, smeared page after page with their own feces, and pasted them calmly over the glass portholes. The screaming promptly stopped. So did the whispering to the microphones. 
After three more days passed, the researchers checked the microphones hourly to make sure they were working since they thought it impossible that no sound could be coming with five people inside. The oxygen consumption in the chamber indicated that all five must still be alive. In fact, it was the amount of oxygen five people would consume at a very heavy level of strenuous exercise. On the morning of the 14th day, the researchers did something they said they would not do to get a reaction from the captives. They used the intercom inside the chamber, hoping to provoke any response from the captives they were afraid were either dead or vegetables. They announced, We are opening the chamber to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one of you your immediate freedom. To their surprise, they heard a single phrase in a calm voice response. We no longer want to be freed. Debate broke out among the researchers and the military forces funding the research. Unable to provoke any more response to using the intercom, it, it was finally decided to open the chamber at midnight on the 15th day. The chamber was flushed with the stimulant gas and filled with fresh air and immediately voices from the microphones began to object. Three different voices began begging as if pleading for the life of loved ones to turn the gas back on. The chamber was opened and soldiers sent in to retrieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever, and so did the soldiers when they saw what was inside. Four of the five su subjects were still alive, although no one could rightly call the state that any of them in life. The food rations past day five had not been so much as touched. There were chunks of meat from the dead test subjects, thigh and chest stuffed into the drain in the center of the chamber, blocking the drain and allowing four inches of water to accumulate on the floor. Precisely how much of the water on the floor was actually blood was never determined. All four surviving test subjects also had large portions of muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. The destruction of flesh and exposed bone on their fingertips indicated that the wounds were inflicted by hand, not with teeth as the researchers initially thought. Closer examination of the position and the angles of the wounds indicated that most, if not all of them, were self-inflicted. The abdominal organs below the rib cage of all four test subjects had been removed. While the heart, lungs, and diaphragm remained in place, the skin and most of the muscles attached to the ribs had been ripped off, exposing the lungs through the rib cage. All the blood vessels and organs remained intact. They had just been taken out and laid on the floor, fanning out around the eviscerated but still living bodies of the subjects. The digestive tract of all four could be seen to be working, digesting food. It quickly became apparent that what they were digesting was their own flesh that they had ripped off and eaten over the course of days. Most of the soldiers were Russian special operatives at the facility, but still many refused to return to the chamber to remove the test subjects. They continued to scream to be left in the chamber and alternately begged and demanded that the gas be turned back on, lest they fall asleep. To everyone's surprise, the test subjects put up a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the Russian soldiers died from having his throat ripped out. Another was gravely injured by having his testicles ripped off and an artery in his leg severed by one of the subject's teeth. Another five of the soldiers lost their lives, if you count ones that committed suicide in the weeks following the incident. In the struggle, one of the four living subjects had his spleen ruptured and he bled out almost immediately. The medical researchers attempted to sedate him, but this proved impossible. He was injected with more than 10 times the human dose of a morphine derivative and still fought like a cornered animal, breaking the ribs and arm of one doctor. When Hart was seen to beat for a full two minutes after he had bled out to the point, there was more air in his vascular system than blood. Even after it stopped, he continued to scream and flail for another three minutes, struggling to attack anyone in reach and just repeating the word more over and over, weaker and weaker, until he finally fell silent. The surviving three test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to a medical facility, the two with intact vocal cords continuously begging for the gas, demanding to be kept awake. The most injured of the three was taken to the only surgical operating room that the facility had. In the process of preparing the subject to have his organs placed back within his body, it was found that he was effectively immune to the sedative they had given him to prepare, for, to prepare him for the surgery. He fought furiously against his restraints when the anesthetic 
anesthetic gas was brought out to put him under. He managed to tear most of the way through a four inch wide leather strap on one wrist, even though the weight of a 200 pound soldier was holding that wrist as well. It took only a little more anesthetic than normal to put him under and the instant his eyelids fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy of the test subject that died on the operating table, it was found that his blood had tripled the normal level of oxygen. His muscles that were still attached to his skeleton were badly torn and he had broken nine bones in his struggle to not be subdued. Most of them were from the force of his own muscles had exerted on them. The second survivor had been the first of the group of the five to start screaming. His vocal cords destroyed. He was unable to beg or object to surgery and he only reacted by shaking his head violently in disapproval when the anesthetic gas was brought near him. He shook his head, yes, when someone suggested reluctantly they try the surgery without anesthetic and did not react to the entire six hour procedure of replacing his abdominal, abdominal organs and attempting to cover them with what remained of his skin. The surgeon presiding stated repeatedly that it should be medically possible for the patient to still be alive. I think that's supposed to be shouldn't be. One terrified nurse assisting the surgery stated that she had seen the patient's mouth curl into a smile several times whenever his eyes met hers. When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly, attempting to talk while struggling. Assuming this must be something of drastic importance, the surgeon had a pen and pad fetched so the patient could write this message. It was simple, keep cutting. The other two test subjects were given the same surgery, both without anesthetic as well, although they had to be injected with a paralytic for the duration of the operation. The surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation while the patients laughed continuously. Once paralyzed, the subjects could only follow the attending researchers with their eyes. The paralytic cleared their system in an abnormally short period of time, and they were soon trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak, they were again asking for the stimulant gas. The researchers tried asking why they had injured themselves, why they had ripped out their own guts, and why they wanted to be given the gas again. Only one response was given, I must remain awake. All three subjects' restraints were reinforced and they were placed back into the chamber awaiting determination as to what should be done with them. The researchers, facing the wrath of their military benefactors for having failed the stated goals of their project considering euthanization, euthanizing the surviving subjects. The commanding officer, a former KGB agent, instead saw potential and wanted to see what would happen if they were put back on the gas. The researchers strongly objected, but were overruled. In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again, the subjects were connected to an EEG monitor and had their restraints padded for long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise, all three stopped struggling the moment it was let slip that they were going back on the gas. It was obvious that at this point, all three were putting up a great struggle to stay awake. One of the subjects that could speak was humming loudly and continuously. The mute subject was straining his legs against the leather bonds with all his might, first left, then right, then left again for something to focus on. The remaining subject was holding his head off his pillow and blinking rapidly. Having been the first to be wired for EEG, most of the researchers were monitoring his brainwaves in surprise. They're, they were normal most of the time, but sometimes flatlined inexplicably. It looked as if he were repeatedly suffering from brain death before returning to normal. As they focused on paper scrolling out of the brainwave monitor, only one nurse saw his eyes slip shut at the same moment his head hit the pillow. His brainwaves immediately changed to that of a deep sleep, then flatlined for the rest of the time as his heart simultaneously stopped. The only remaining subject that could speak started screaming to be sealed in now. His brainwave showed the same flat lines as one who had just died from falling asleep. The commander gave the order to seal the chamber with both subjects inside, as well as three researchers. One of the named three immediately drew his gun and shot the commander point blank between the eyes, then turned the gun on the mute subject and blew his brains out as well. He pointed his gun at the remaining subject, still restrained to a bed, as the remaining members of the medical and research team fled the room. I won't be locked in here with these things. Not with you, he screamed at the man strapped to the table. What are you, he demanded. I must know. The subject smiled. Have you forgotten so easily, the subject asked. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence 
and paralysis when you go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. The researcher paused, then aimed at the subject's heart and fired. The EEG flatlined as the subject weakly choked out, so nearly free. That was really good, other than like a couple typos. That was really good. Oof. I don't think this other one is that long. No. Okay. So the second one I'm going to read is called The Rake. A suicide note, 1964. As I prepare to take my life, I feel it necessary to assuage any guilt or pain I have introduced through this act. It is not the fault of anyone other than him. For once I awoke and felt his presence, and once I awoke and saw his form, once again I awoke and heard his voice and looked into his eyes. I cannot sleep without fear of what might next, of what I might next awake to experience. I cannot ever wake. Goodbye. Found in the same wooden box were two empty envelopes addressed to William and Rose and one loose personal letter with no envelope. Dearest Lenny, I have prayed for you. He spoke your name. A journal entry translated from Spanish, 1880. I have experienced the greatest terror. I have experienced the greatest terror. I have experienced the greatest terror. I see his eyes when I close mine. They are hollow, black. They saw me and pierced me. His wet hand, I will not sleep. His voice unintelligible text. A Mariner's Log, 1691. He came to me in my sleep. From the foot of my bed, I felt a sensation. He took everything. We must return to England. We shall not return here again at the request of the rake. From a Witness, 2006. Three years ago, I had just returned from a trip from Ni Niagara Falls with my family for the 4th of July. We were all very exhausted after a long day of driving, so my husband and I put the kids right to bed and called it a night. At about 4 a.m., I woke up thinking my husband had gotten up to use the restroom. I used the moment to steal back the sheets, only to wake him in the process. I apologized and told him I thought he'd gotten out of bed. When he turned to face me, he gas gasped and pulled his feet up from the end of the bed so quickly his knee almost knocked me out of the bed. He then grabbed me and said nothing. After adjusting to the dark for half a second, I was able to see what caused the strange reaction. At the foot of the bed, sitting and facing away from us, there was what appeared to be a naked man or a large, hairless dog of some sort. Its body position was disturbing and unnatural, as if it had been hit by a car or something. For some reason, I was not instantly frightened by it, but more concerned as to its condition. At this point, I was somewhat under the assumption that, they were, that we were supposed to help him. My husband was peering over, the arm, over his arm and knee, tucked into the fetal position, occasionally glancing at me before returning to the creature. In a flurry of motion, the creature scrambled around the side of the bed and then crawled quickly in a flailing sort of motion right along the bed until it was less than a foot from my husband's face. The creature was completely silent for about 30 seconds, or probably closer to five. It just seemed like a while, just looking at my husband. The creature then placed its hand on his knee and ran into the hallway, leading to the kid's room. I screamed and ran for the light switch, planning to stop him before he hurt my children. When I got to the hallway, the light from the bedroom was enough to see it crouching and hunched over about 20 feet away. He turned around and looked directly at me, covered in blood. I flipped the switch on the wall and saw my daughter, Clara. The creature ran down the stairs while my husband and I rushed to help our daughter. She was very badly injured and spoke only once more in her short life. She said, he is the rake. My husband drove his car into a lake that night while rushing our daughter to the hospital. He did not survive. Being a small town, news got around pretty quickly. The police were helpful at first, and the local newspaper took a lot of interest as well. However, the story was never published, and the local television news never followed up either. For several months, my son Justin and I stayed in a hotel near my parents' house. After we decided to return home, I began looking for answers myself. I eventually located a man in the next town over who had a similar story. We got in contact and began talking about our experiences. He knew of two other people in New York who had seen the creature we now refer to as the rake. It took the four of us about two solid years of hunting on the interest and on the internet and writing letters to come up with a small collection of what we believe to be accounts of the rake. None of them gave any details, history, or follow-up. One journal had an entry involving the creature in its first three pages and then never mentioned it again. A ship's log explained nothing of the encounter, saying only that they were told to leave by the rake. That was the very last entry in the log. 
There were, however, many instances where the creature's visit was one of a series of visits with the same person. Multiple people also mentioned being spoken to, my daughter included. This led us to wonder if the rake had visited any of us before our last encounter. I set up a digital recorder near my bed and left it running all night, every night for two weeks. I would tediously scan through the sounds of me rolling around in my bed each day when I woke up. By the end of the second week, I was quite used to the occasional sound of sleep while blurring through the recording at eight times the normal speed. This still took almost an hour every day. On the first day of the third week, I thought I heard something different. What I found was a shrill voice. It was the rake. I can't listen to it long enough to even begin to transcribe it. I haven't let anyone listen to it yet. And all I know is that I've heard it before and I now believe that it spoke when it was sitting in front of my husband. I don't remember hearing anything at the time, but for some reason, the voice on the recorder immediately brings me back to that moment. The thoughts that must have gone through my daughter's head make me very upset. I have not seen the rake since he ruined my life, but I know that he has been in my room while I slept. I know and fear that one night I'll wake up to see him staring at me. That one actually gave me goosebumps. I don't know why. Really well done. Well written. I love it. Ooh, that one gave me the eebie-jeebies. Okay, so this one I'm hoping is going to be the stick. My computer's going very weird. This one's pretty short, I think. Yeah, this one's pretty short. I'm really worried this isn't going to be the right one, but I guess it doesn't really matter. It's still a, a creepypasta, and, you know, it is what it is. So we're just going to read it. This one is just called, um, I think it's just called Stairs. Yeah, it's just called Stairs. October. This was done October 30th of 2012. Okay. Um, it's pretty short. In 1984, there lived an old widowed lady by herself in a two-story house who was completely immobile and bound to her wheelchair. Ever since the mysterious death of her husband, the, she required the aid of a carer who would visit her daily to help her with everyday tasks. What made it even more difficult was the fact that the two floors of the house were only connected by an old staircase inside. When the old lady needed to move between the two, the carer would have to carry her frail body like an infant up and down the stairs. One day, the police received a call from the widow. There had been a murder. Since police units were scarce at the time and the murderer had already fled the scene, only one detective was sent out to conduct the initial crime scene report. He arrived to see the carer's body splayed out on the floor with her vocal cords ripped out in a pool of blood on the first level of the house. With the old lady atop the staircase in her wheelchair watching him, still and silently, seemingly in shock, he could immediately rule her out as a suspect due to her inability to move up and down the stairs and because she was trapped up there at the time the murder had taken place. It was similar to the death of her husband many years ago who had suffocated in his sleep on the couch downstairs. The detective put on his gloves, took photos, swabbed for evidence, and covered the body until the coroner arrived, coroner arrived later. All routine business. He scoped the house downstairs for any clues and asked the old lady if he could look upstairs. She insisted that she was upstairs the whole time and no one apart from her had been up there that day. But regardless of this, the detective ascended the staircase to which she hesitantly moved aside. Beyond the staircase, there were a narrow... There was a narrow corridor with three closed doors along it. He checked behind each of the doors, the empty bedroom, nothing, the bathroom, nothing. He became anxious as he slowly made his way to the final bedroom where the old lady slept. He opened it and everything looked normal, a bed, a wardrobe, and a bedside table with a lamp. He checked every wall of the room in horror as it was not what he discovered, but it was what he didn't discover that made him stop dead in his tracks and slowly reach for his gun in its holster. It was a detail so minor that they had completely overlooked it on the last investigation of the husband's death. There was no phone upstairs. He suddenly heard a noise as he withdrew his gun and rushed out of the room, only to find an empty wheelchair atop the stairs. Yeah, that can't be the one that's for this movie. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to find out which one it is because I want to read it before I see the movie. But this is the only one that I could find that was called Stairs. If you know which one it is, comment below and let me know because I'm very curious because I really want to see it. I mean, I'm sorry. I really want to read it. So anyway, that was just reading a couple of creepypastas um, that I thought would be fun to read. I don't, I haven't read any of those before. So um, the rake one really got to me. I know there's like video games about the rake and stuff too, but anyway, 
Uh, yeah, so hope you guys enjoy the rest of your week and have a great weekend, and I will see you in the next one.